So our, our next speaker, uh, you'll re recall we, we had a bit of a swap around. So our next speaker, I'm delighted to say, is uh, Steve Sands from the BCS. Um, I have the pleasure of sitting on the British Computer Society uh, Finance Committee, which is the, the group where when special interest groups or regions put in an application for funding to put on an event or a sponsorship or anything like that, including this one, um, the, the Finance Committee yeah, d discusses what, what the event's for, what the benefit to society is, what the benefit to the BCS is. Um, and it's fair to say that by far the busiest uh, application process we have is, is from Steve's team. They do a massive amount of uh, uh, security uh, related stuff for the BCS. And so I'm delighted uh, that our next presenter is Steve Sands. He's left the book behind, that's mine now. I didn't have Dave Cartwright down as being a bad person, but following this fella is not very fair, is it? It's really not. It's really not. Okay. Um, hi. Simon Hep um, Hepburn did that this morning, and everyone sort of woke up and went hi back eventually. Hi. Um, I am Steve Sands. I'm the chair of the Information Security Specialist Group at the BCS over on the mainland. I'm just learning how Jersey works a little bit. Uh, it's been fantastic. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say, first of all, I am absolutely blown away by everything that's happened just in the last sort of 24 hours. So blown away almost physically landing at the airport yesterday. That wasn't much fun. That was interesting. Um, it, it's one of the few times that I've been on a plane and, and all the passengers have applauded as we got down onto the runway. It was really good. Uh, it was a bit blowy. Um, but I'm also blown away by the conference, by the island, by the people, by the whole setup here. It's fantastic. So uh, congratulations to Dave and the team. Uh, and, and I think this community that you've got going on here is fantastic. So. Um, I'm just going to whiz through some of this. Uh, Dave's allowed me half an hour. I don't think I'm going to be half an hour. So you might even get a few more minutes off the amount of time between you and the drinks and whatever happens at the end. Uh, so a quick introduction to me, quick introduction to my day job, which is with a small company that nobody's ever heard of called Synectic Solutions. A um, little bit of background to the BCS and to the ISSG, the Information Security Specialist Group, that I'm really here to represent today um, and then I want to talk about something that I think we don't probably talk about enough, which is the language that we use when we're talking about information and cybersecurity. And uh, it, it, it's a sort of simple su uh, subject. It's probably a good way to start wrapping up the day. It's not too detailed, it's not too technical, it's not too hard. Um, but it is something that is vitally important. And, and I think, you know, within the room, all of us, understand the language that we use and why we use it and how we use it, where we use it, all that stuff. But in reality, if we don't adapt it for the audience that we're talking to, then uh, it all becomes a bit pointless. And typically that's to senior managers, to boards, is to the people who hold the purse strings that buy the things that we need to do the job that we do. Um, so I'll, I'll rattle through a few things in there fairly quickly, I think, and, and I've got a few pictures of Dad's army, just because I found them and I thought they were funny and I thought I'd stick them in the slides because it made people smile. No other reason, really. So um, this is me. Uh, it was interesting when Simon was talking this morning about the different routes into information security, cyber security. Uh, I don't quite know what's going on with this. Um, that might change again. It did. Look at that. That's weird, isn't it? Must be an old version of the slides got, that's got some auto timings on it. That's going to be really awkward. Anyways, so about me, uh, started off in post office telecoms way back when, quite a long time ago. Um, I'm just going to flick this backwards and forwards now to keep it going and to keep your attention. Keep me on the line. Um, worked on various switching systems, so all the way through from Strouger, the old click and bash stuff, through electronic, through to digital, a couple of digital systems and then moved into a training role and started doing security stuff, which was where really I started then 
my journey into information security uh, that got me here today. Um, round about 18, 19 years ago, I moved, jumped ship. Well, the post office sold, or British Telecom sold off all of their training stuff to another company, half owned by them, half owned by Accenture. And, and it didn't really work for me, so I thought, I'll do something different. And at the time, I had the chance to go and work at a, a fairly new, fledgling little company based in Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire, if you know where that is. Um, and we are the largest fraud prevention agency in the UK. Nobody's ever heard of us, but we have uh, massive banks as clients, all the way from the biggest to the smallest, everything in between, insurance companies, um, mobile phone companies, utilities, you name it, we do it. So lots of, lots of stuff going on there. Uh, and when I started there, they needed, they were small, there were less than 200 people, uh, and they needed people to do all sorts of things. So it was time to just adapt to whatever needed to be done at the time. Project management, pre-sales, IT management. I ran their IT, um, their IT department for a while. And then, slowly but surely, they realized that information security was becoming really important to their clients whose data we process and that they needed a dedicated security function. So I kind of took that on. Why wouldn't I? Um, these days, I'm doing less of that, maybe more of that in a moment. I'm doing more data protection than information security, but it's kind of still where my heart is. Um, and then I took over as chair of the information security specialist group uh, a couple of years ago. So, a little bit about uh, Synectic Solutions. Not too much. Um, we... As it says on the slide, we've got about 300 million odd records, all coming from the UK population. Well, in truth, that's what it says on our website. It's more like half a billion these days, something like that. We, but none of it's our data. And the people whose data it is, tier one banks, insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera, really care about what we do with it. They seem to be really fussy about what we do with it. So we are audited and questionnaires coming in every other week, audited to within an inch of our life, to be honest. Uh, and, and that's the life I lead, because we're a service provider who is a bulk data processor of data that doesn't belong to us. And the people who do own it really care. Um, so it's quite challenging. Uh, we've got lots of security frameworks, and uh, it's all coming out of our ears. But we're on that, um, we're on that supply chain path. And uh, those of you who work in financial services, you probably think those people further down the supply chain are my biggest risk. Uh, and that would be me. <laughs> so we do all sorts of stuff. We do um, customer fraud screening. We do employee partner broker vetting. We do uh, IDV, uh, AML, all, all sorts of things for all of these large institutions. Um, and in the private sector, we think we've saved about £5 billion since we've been operating. The first client that we took on, so it's all about data syndication. The first client that we took on was um, a, a, a building society in the UK. Now, given that we were talking about syndicating data, it's a bit difficult to syndicate data from multiple organisations if you've only got one. But we started with the Abbey National Building Society, as was, uh, and we've now got about 160 odd clients and we run all of the fraud systems over in Canada as well with a partner over there so all of the banks and building societies etc in Canada run through our software as well we operate that from the UK from our from our humble little place in Stoke-on-Trent uh, and we've been doing that for the private sector now since about 2004 2005 2006 um, and we've been doing public sector stuff as well so we run a system called the NFI the National Fraud Initiative for the cabinet office. We run some Immigration Act screening for every bank in the UK. It doesn't matter whether you're a UK institution. If you offer certain types of products to the UK population, then you have to use our software to do this Immigration Act screening because the Home Office produced a thing called the Disqualified Persons List. And every application for a current account needs to go through it and needs to be re-vetted through it every quarter. So there's plenty of work going on there. There's plenty of data flowing around the place. Uh, and it's all coming through our little place in Staffordshire. Uh, and we've just um, started working with GDS, which is a function of Cabinet Office, uh, as part of the new government one login service. So lots going on. 
Um, so that's the synecdoche bit. That's my day job. I do that four days a week, um, part-time these days, four days a week. That's nice, isn't it? Hoping to go down to three soon. That would be good. Um, but my hobby, I suppose, is the Information Security Specialist Group, which is part of the BCS, the British Computer Society, which is the Chartered Institute for IT. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. It became charter chartered in 1984. The ISSG has been around uh, since 1983, and in fact, we celebrated the 40th birthday earlier this year at the offices at Murgate in London. Uh, and, and we had all of the great and the good from BCS, plus as many past chairs and committee members as I could find going back to 1983 to when we started. Um, so we've been around for quite a while. It was started as a computer uh, security specialist group, morphed into the information security specialist group, uh, and we're one of about 50-odd specialist groups operating within BCS. So um, just to get a bit of movement going, how many of you here are already members of the BCS? Obviously, this fella here. Uh, okay, so we've got a few. We've got about 70,000-odd members at the moment, the space for plenty more. Given the size of IT, we should have an awful, awful lot more than that. Uh, we're the largest specialist group. We've got about 3,500 odd members, which I think is about 5% of the membership. But again, if you think about it, information security, cyber security touches every single aspect of IT, and therefore we should have a lot more than that as well. Uh, what do we do? We support all the, the, the main BCS pillars, so membership, progression, inspiration, influence, um, and then we try and link that down into our own agenda. So I'm not paid by BCS, I'm a volunteer as far as BCS is concerned. All of the specialist groups are run by the members for the members. So if you've got time, uh, I would heartily recommend joining BCS. We do huge numbers of events, many of them face-to-face, -face, usually in our London office at Moorgate, but the vast majority of those events these days are also hybrid, so that people who are remote up and down the country or over here in beautiful Jersey can also tune in and get the benefit from it. So, a um, little bit more on that thing. I've probably covered all of that discipline that touches everything else. What was interesting when we did the 40th thing, um, a couple of months ago was that one of the original chairs came along and talked about how it all was when it started, the computer security specialist group. Uh, and the interesting thing for me was that the core principles that we all still work towards today, you know, preserving confidentiality, integrity, availability, were absolutely the three core principles that they had then. That bit hasn't changed. Technology's changed, all the tools and techniques and the, the stuff that we do has changed. But all of the core stuff came out of 1980s and still exists today pretty much exactly as it was. So, language of information security. I, I think it's, all, it, it's dead interesting, isn't it? Because we all use words and phrases and jargon all the time. You know, you just do because you wouldn't be able to get through the day unless you did. And jargon's fine. Um, however, we need to be careful about the language that we use because when we're talking outside our own groups, sometimes security people can be thought of as being just a little bit negative just a little bit doomy sometimes, yeah? Um, we'll go on to some, what some of those words might be in a moment, and we'll just, we'll just ponder whether they're the appropriate words to use at, at, at all times, in all places, and to all people. Because quite often, you, if you just think about the impact that those words are going to have, you might just phrase something in a slightly different way. So it very much does depend on who you're talking to, uh, and what it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. So the language of information security really comes from what we do, doesn't it? And the truth is we all feed off all of the things that we've been talking about all the way through today. You know, we love a good breach as long as it's someone else's, don't we? Yeah, because we can learn from someone else's without having all of the pain and hassle that goes with 
uh, it, it, uh, it landing on our doorstep. And we'll have a good risk register. Actually, that national risk register came out just a, a month or so ago. Um, and it's not bad. It's not a bad read. I wouldn't recommend it lasting at night just before you turn the lights out, but um, there's some good stuff in it. What's interesting for me is how cyber has gone up and up and up and up and up in terms of government recognition of the importance of it and where it sits amongst all of the other risks uh, that government is now considering. So it's probably worth a quick, uh, quick look. But the point here is that as information security or cyber security leaders, we need to be very, very careful about the language that we use when we're talking, not only to our peers, but almost more importantly, to our senior leadership colleagues and to the board. Because if we get that wrong, all of the things that we know we need to do, all of the things that we want to do, all of the people that we need, the tools that we need, the, you know, all of that stuff costs money, doesn't it? And these are the folks who will provide the funds to us as long as we can articulate it well enough to them. So as leaders, I think we need to use language that portrays security risks in the context of the business. And we also need to recognize that security risks aren't the only risks that these folks are dealing with. You know, information security, cyber security takes its place in amongst all of the other risks and opportunities that the board is considering, yeah? So, um, I think we overuse jargon. I think jargon has its place and we, we use jargon. If we use it appropriately, it's great because everybody understands what it is. I, but I do think that people can occasionally become disenfranchised by the use of jargon in the wrong place. And, and I'm thinking particularly of the senior folks who don't get it. Now, quite often they'll challenge, but more often they'll just switch off and that's worse. Uh, or the early careers people who are just coming into the sector to work with us and they're absolutely bombarded with jargon that they don't get. They haven't been taught it at university on their course. They don't get it. And uh, we're leaving them behind. And there's no good reason for that. So we need to bring them with us and translate that jargon according to the, uh, the audience that we have sitting in front of us. My wife's a counsellor, and, and, and this is one of the things that reputedly they say all the time. How does that make you feel? Um, and, and these are all words that I think, you know, generally speaking, we, we use on a regular basis. So, um, no is the first one. No. No, you can't have that. No, you can't do that. No, that's a terrible idea. Um, I banned the word no from our security team back at Synectix many years ago. I said, don't use the word no, please. Ever. It's all about listening. And, and again, going back to the counselling thing, my wife says as a counsellor, she listens twice as much as she speaks, at least. You know, that's the sort of a ratio. And I think in security, we probably can learn from that because the more senior you get, the more you need to listen to what's going on around you, what your peers, what your other senior managers are doing, what the board's looking for. It's about listening and making sure that we can provide us the service that the business needs. So no is a, a, a word that I, I, I just barred completely. I said, I don't, want to hear, I don't want to hear no. What I do want to hear is, what's the problem? How can we help you? Yeah? How can we help you solve that problem so that the business can do what the business needs to do, wants to do? Um, policy, compliance, control. Uh, Policy is interesting, isn't it? I've written so many security policies now over the years. Uh, I, I remember um, we started out, when I took over doing security stuff, we started out with one security policy. And it was this kind of this thick. And it was, lots of it was dictated to us by the organizations that provide data, so banks. And banks love a good security policy, don't they? Uh, so it was yay thick, and it was impossible to read. So I said, OK, we'll break that all down, and, and, and we'll break it into manageable chunks that people can go and find the bit that they need fairly quickly because the policy will be called what it is, you know, um, remote working policy, for instance. And that worked, except that we ended up with a, a suite of 50-odd policies. Uh, and then the board came to me and said, 
that don't work for us. There's too many policies. We can't be having all of these policies. There's too much. And, and on the one hand, I get it, because policy is impossible, isn't it? It's impossible not to have it, because certainly all of our clients expect us to have it. Um, but it's also impossible to work with. It's impossible, it's not reasonable to expect every member of staff to annually read all of the security policies, because there's 50 odd of them. Uh, so how do, you, how do you do that? And so here's a question for you. I, I often relate uh, information security stuff to um, the road system or driving or you know, whatever, uh, just to try and make, you know, make it understandable. And, and I relate an information security policy in some way to the highway code. Now, how many of you drive cars? Yeah. How many of you have read the highway code in the last year? The updates on Yeah, it's brilliant. How many of you follow all the rules and recommendations in the highway code? So in other words, where, where you pass a sign that says 30 mile an hour, you stick to it. You know? Security policies, it's the same kind of concept, isn't it? We expect people to know it, to, to understand it, and to abide by it, and to sign their life away to say they're going to every year. And we actually record that within the HR system to say, I've read it and I will abide by it. But in reality, can they, do they? I don't think so. Um, that's where the awareness piece comes in, I think, in terms of refreshing people, people's ideas about what's right, what's wrong, and making sure that they've got someone to go and talk to and ask if they need to, yeah? So not necessarily expecting them to remember everything that's written down in 50 security policies, but to have somewhere that they can go to. Um, so control, audit, breach, risk, vulnerability, threat, etc., etc., etc. It goes on, doesn't it? Um, I, I shan't drag this out. Information security versus cybersecurity is something that, that resonates with me a little bit. It's interesting because this is the information security forum for the Channel Islands, but this is the cybersecurity conference. I think we've, we've got almost a little bit of a, a, an, an ID crisis going on between the two because some people use the terms interchangeably and some people don't. And indeed, some people who work in one look at the other one and they're a little bit snotty about it, you know, so cybersecurity. I often hear people who work in cybersecurity saying, well, you know, your information security policy and your ISMS is great, mate, but it doesn't stop the bad guys getting in. And that's true to, to an extent, but, uh, which, is, which brings me back to the idea that actually you need both. Most organizations need a bit of both. So you need some cybersecurity people, good cybersecurity people with good tools. You need some information security people who will maintain and run your ISMS for you and take an overall risk perspective to the whole thing. Uh, because for me, everything's driven by risk, really. So I'm not, I'm not sold on the idea of purely putting in control-based systems, although I think uh, Cyber Essentials is really good. Still sat there. Cyber Essentials is really good. Um, if I think about all of the control systems that I use within our business, though, so we've got 27,001. How many here do 27,001? Most of you, I imagine, have some. How many have done the 2022 version? Transition to it, well done, great, yeah. Um, and, and it's quite good. There's some good bits in it. There's a few bits that I didn't really think were appropriate for it. Uh, you've got the Cyber Essential, you've got the Cyber Essentials Plus, you've got a cloud control matrix, you've got CIS control matrix, you, if you do credit card stuff, you've got PCI DSS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've got all of these different control frameworks feeding up into a single ISMS, and, and that, for me, is valuable where you can use those controls to demonstrate some risk reduction, because that's really what the board's interested in. Now, I do think that these two things are getting closer. Uh, 27,001, the latest version, uh, is getting much closer to cybersecurity framework and vice versa. Cybersecurity framework, latest version, has another ring to it, which is governance, which sort of marries up partly to clauses four to 10 in 27,001. Great. So they are getting closer. Maybe in time we'll only have to run one of them. I don't know. I think it's probably unlikely. But again, ultimately, this whole thing comes down to risk. 
and how you articulate risk. How you measure risk, sure, and, and you know, I speak to lots of people about how they do their risk stuff. So do they use qualitative or do you use quantitative? Quantitative, quite hard work, uh, need a lot more data, and it needs a lot more management, I think, to do it well. So most people still base it on a simple sort of five by five style matrix, and they do the qualitative. As far as the board is concerned, they're interested in the risk from generally a fairly high level. Is it green? Great. I don't need to worry about it. Thanks very much. Is it amber? Well, it's a bit like green to the board, to be honest. Uh, until it turns red, they're maybe not going to be that interested in it. Um, but for the CISO, definitely interested in the amber because that has the danger of creeping into the red and then people are going to ask awkward questions about it. So red usually means, to the board at least, actually I just want some more information on this yet uh, at this point. Might, not, might be red to you, but it might not be red to me in terms of all of the other risks that I'm trying to manage at the moment. So it is about having that context. Am I running out of time? Almost there. No? We're okay. So how much does a board need to know about information and about cyber security? Uh, well, truth is, they don't care that much about some of the things that we all care about until they go wrong, of course. They don't care about DDoS. They don't care about all of the threats that we've been talking about. What they do care about is whether we're doing our job and managing them, whether we're stopping these things turning into breaches, reputational loss, financial loss, and all of the consequences that go with it that we've been talking about today. But they won't actually invest in any of that risk reduction unless they understand the risk in a language that works for them. Not the language that works for us, but the language that works for them. So articulating risk to the board in a way that they can properly understand it and benchmark it against all of the other things that are going on that will then let them invest in the things that we all need just to do our job is the trick. And that's why I think language is so important. If we get it wrong, we don't get the stuff that we need, we can't do our job, businesses are going to suffer. And in some cases, as we've heard today, they're going to fail. So uh, the quote there, security isn't a technology problem, it's a business problem. And we've heard that already today, haven't we? It's a business problem when things fail. It's a business problem when we have a data breach. Obviously, it goes wider than that too, but fundamentally to the business, that's what it is. So the language we use is really critical, and the best CISOs are fluent in both security and business. They're translators, if you will. So um, my plea to you, I guess, is be realistic when you're putting these business cases together. Be realistic about the actual business impact. By all means, use examples of where other organizations have been caught out because they haven't thought about it properly. But be realistic about these things because you'll be caught out if you start inflating them wildly just to make a business case. Try and work out what the real likelihood is, and that's difficult. You know, probability or likelihood is a really difficult thing to say. Sure, you can say, well, it happened to them over there, and, you know, we've got a similar control set to them, so if it happened to them, it could happen to us. And, of course, the board will come back and say, well, but we've been running for 20 years, and it's never happened yet. Uh, and, and that's the trick, then, is to articulate that risk in a way that you will get their buy-in and express the overall cost and benefit of that risk reduction to them. Um, and that's tricky too. So this is my final slide. Um, these are a few words from, I think, last Sunday's or the previous Sunday's Sunday Sprinkle by the guy who took over uh, as CEO of the BCS um, last year, I think it was. Might have been the beginning of this year. Uh, and, and he does this little Sunday sprinkle blog thing. It's Rashik Palmer, and he's really good. 
Uh, and if you get a chance, look him up on LinkedIn, have a look at some of the stuff that he does. He's really moving the BCS forward. We started the year uh, with about, uh, maybe a year or so ago, with about 60,000 members. We're up to 75 now. Membership isn't that expensive, and if you're an organization, you can take out an organizational membership of the BCS for less than a grand, and that includes 10 members of staff, personal membership for them, and then you can just bolt on to that. And you get an awful lot out of that. You get access to information, to webinars, to awareness, to all sorts of things. At the moment, I'm working with uh, a couple of groups. I'm working, I've got a round table on Tuesday of next week, talking about service resilience and, and from a global perspective. So we're looking at the idea that all of our systems these days are so complex and so interrelated that uh, failures in particular places could almost have, you know, could have a catastrophic effect not only on the organizations but the country or the world. And, and we're trying to take that sort of holistic view of service resilience and interconnectivity and dependence. So that's going on. Uh, we've got another group working on AI. We've got another group working on post-quantum crypt cryptography, which I think will be a big thing. And some of the banks, certainly the telecom sector, is heavily invested in it right now. Um, one of the concerns is that if we don't move reasonably quickly with it, because of course you know, we're looking at um, huge investment in quantum computers, and whilst that's here today, it's not here at the scale that you might think it's gonna cause us a problem. But in truth, um, uh, one of the concerns we've got is harvest the data now and decrypt it later when we have got access to that level of computing power on tap. You know, buy it as a service. So protecting data now from a post-quantum computing world is probably not a bad thing to start thinking about. And that harvest now, decrypt later piece. It, we, we tend to think that encryption is a great thing and, and it will protect us. And it does from attackers today using today's technology, but that will not always be the case. So if it's really sensitive and it's got a shelf life, the data's got a shelf life of tens or hundreds of years, whatever it is, just think about that post-quantum impact on it uh, at this stage. So uh, Rashik said um, words sculpt perception, and I've just highlighted there, while negative or disempowering verbiage can undermine credibility and erode relationships, and I think that's really true. If you, if you don't choose your words very carefully for your audience and for the context, then you might as well not bother, to be honest. Um, that empathy and connection piece is really vital as well. So effective communication, establishment of robust relationships hinge on empathy. So, and that empathy needs to be two-way, otherwise the communication doesn't work two-way. When we meticulously select our words, mindful of their potential impact on others, we're effectively demonstrating empathy. We get it, that's what we're saying, we get it. Customize your words for your audience, one size fits all language is not appropriate. It just doesn't work. So as senior leaders or as CISOs, you need to be thinking about who you're talking to and why and what it's all about and what you want out of that situation and adjust your language accordingly. So this entails comprehending preferences, communication styles, even cultural subtleties. So um, not necessarily a focus on the technical detail of security this time, but I think for anyone who has a relationship particularly with the board, who pay for all of the things that we want to do to protect our organizations, thinking about some of this stuff in advance of having those conversations will pay bonuses. Thank you very much. <laughs>